Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Stephen Balcom, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Family Online Safety Institute. FOSI is an international nonprofit organization that works to make the online world safer for kids and their families. And we convene leaders in industry, government, and the nonprofit sectors to collaborate and innovate new solutions and policies in the field of online safety. FOSI's membership includes some of the leading technology companies in the world, including some representatives from some of uh, are on our panel today from Google, from Disney and Microsoft. Um, and we've also convened and collaborate with other experts and leaders, uh, which today also include Lego and UNICEF. Uh, before we start, one quick note on logistics. Uh, please feel free to submit questions through the chat function on your screen, and uh, I will do my best to get to as many of those as possible. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to view at our website, fozy.org, as well as on our YouTube page. And the conference platform that we're on today, Hopin, is also what we will be using to host our annual conference in November. Uh, it allows multiple stages to be used at the same time, and even virtual exhibitors booths set up to display demos and content and products. In fact, our panelists today have provided materials for their virtual booths, and I encourage you to click over to the exhibit hall um, when it opens right after our panel conversation. Not yet, but uh, right at the end, I'll give you another reminder. So uh, let's begin. And according to a recent report in Axios, in fact, it came out, I think two mornings ago, an estimated 62% of American school kids are starting the year virtually, with many of the rest facing the same fate should COVID caseloads rise in their areas. Only 19%, one out of five, are having in-person school every day, with another 18% in hybrid formats. So educational and enriching online content is especially important right now. And with all of this uncertainty, there is a real need for kids to have access to content that adds to their academic success. Now, if that weren't enough to add to all of this uncertainty, as many as 15 million children in the United States lack a broadband connection and a suitable device in order to access online classes, according to a recent Washington Post article. So, to help us navigate this very challenging space, we have gathered a remarkable panel of some of the leading voices in the educational and entertainment space for kids. Um, and as is our uh, tradition here at FOSI, I'd actually like to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and to very briefly describe the work that you do in this space. And let's do this in alphabetical order. Um, Josie, why don't you begin? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Great. So so thanks firstly for the invitation. It's great to to join this very interesting and timely conversation. I, I'm Josiane Galia Baron or Josie. I'm a member of the children's rights and business team in UNICEF's office in Geneva. Uh, the unit looks at different ways businesses impact on children's rights around the world through their operations and practices looking specifically at sectoral issues and cross-cutting themes like uh, family-friendly workplace policies. But over the last several years, we've also been looking much closer at the risks and opportunities that digital technologies bring for children's rights. And we've created tools and guidance for the ICT sector, which is which is my focus. So obviously with, with COVID and school closures and other measures, these issues have really been brought much further into the spotlight. Um, I'll leave it at that and thank you again for the invitation. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Great, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, Alicia, I think you're next alphabetically. Hi everyone, so I'm Alicia Blumross. I'm the public policy lead for kids and families at Google. Um, and I work across the company ranging from working with um, YouTube kids and YouTube learning and all aspects of YouTube through to um, G Suite for Education, Google Chromebooks, Google Play, you know, a variety of different places in Google that work on issues relating to learning, to kids and families' experiences, and to creating 
tools and services that help mm -hmm. parents and educators feel more confident about supporting children as they connect, create, and learn and play in many ways online. Um, I am a former researcher at the London School of Economics and Public, uh, sorry, London School of Economics and Political Science, and um, recently published a book called Parenting for a Digital Future, which I think will be relevant um, in some cases to this conversation. And I am the mother of seven-year-old uh, new second graders who are inside struggling their way through their <laughs> morning meeting, most likely right now. Uh, so living out many of these debates myself at the moment. Uh, shameless plug, uh, go out and get Alicia and Sonia Livingston's new book. It is absolutely fantastic, stacked full of uh, research and, uh, and, and very interesting insights uh, from the work that you guys have done. So congratulations on that, uh, Alicia. Um, Jim, why don't you say hello? Thank you very much. So I'm Jim Filipachos, uh, based in London with the Walt Disney Company, uh, managing global public policy issues across our various businesses, which <clears> include uh, our film studios, our uh, various TV networks, our parks, resorts, and cruise lines, uh, consumer products and publishing, uh, among others. And uh, like Alicia, also managing through these issues at home with a teen and a preteen. So it's both uh, vital on the work front for Disney and uh, vital on our on our home front. So really appreciate the opportunity to contribute to the conversation. And it's, of course, so timely and uh, important. So thank you very much to Fossey. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yes, this is personal. Uh, Liana, could you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, um, I'm Leanna Prater. I'm a solutions architect at LEGO Education. Um, and as a solutions architect, I spend a lot of time out in the field um, talking with uh, district leaders, school administrators, teachers, um, really getting a feel for the need um, and ways that uh, we can be a thought partner um, in helping them try to problem solve whatever um, issues they are having. And right now, a lot of that is um, around virtual learning, hybrid learning, um, and making sure that kids are having these opportunities um, for engaging activities um, that include things offline as well as online. Um, I'm a former uh, teacher, um, spent many years in the classroom, um, spent many years at the district level office supporting technology. So I have a heart for teachers and a parent. I'm a parent as well. So um, these are interesting times that we are in. Um, so very excited to be part of this very important conversation today. Fantastic, yes, and uh, our hearts go out to the teachers who are working in classrooms in person with kids with the potential for risking their own health. It is quite an extraordinary time. Um, last but not least, Deirdre. Great, thanks, Stephen, and thanks, Fosti. My name is Deirdre Kornstrom, and I lead the Minecraft education team at Microsoft. Um, Minecraft Education Edition is a version of Minecraft that we've designed for classroom experiences and now for remote and hybrid learning. Um, it's, it's a great tool for engaging um, students in everything from digital citizenship and social emotional learning through to uh, chemistry and computer science. I'm also on the board of a nonprofit called Block by Block, which uses Minecraft in the developing world. Um, I'm on the board of an independent school here in the Seattle area, and I also have uh, two children, a sixth grader and a high school sophomore. So this is all very, very near and dear to my heart. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, let's get uh, let's get right into the conversation. And again, uh, if you uh, watching this, presumably at home, although maybe some of you are actually in a physical office or school. Uh, please do send in your questions via the chat function. Um, Liana, let me start with you. Talk, talk a little bit about the balance that needs to be struck between being a consumer of technology and a creator with technology and how that fits into this extraordinary moment that we're currently in. Yeah, um, a topic that I love to talk about, um, and I would say it's a topic of great importance um, in a pandemic and outside of a pandemic. And it, it's that question around what are kids doing with technology? Um, a lot of times in classrooms, um, you know, we use technologies uh, to provide students with opportunities to read uh, for information. So maybe they're reading a web page, maybe a blog post, maybe they're watching videos, um, maybe they're interacting with a game that somebody else has created, all for fabulous educational purposes. Um, and we know that, that those resources have a very important role um, in education. But it's also partnered with this idea around um, 
creating, you know, um, kids also need to be creators with technology. And I'm going to pull out a name that I, I love all the time is Seymour Papert. Um, and, um, and I, when I read Seymour Papert's book called Mindstorms, um, couple years ago and he wrote it in the 80s he could have written it last week but it's you know it's a very important idea around kids have a device in their hand and it's a very uh, powerful tool that they have available to them and during this time especially we know that probably more than ever in history kids have access to a device maybe not necessarily access to the internet but access to something that they can create with they can share ideas and explore the world around them. Um, and so I challenge teachers often to think about this, this role. Like um, when you're creating an assignment for kids, you know, are you asking them to consume technology all the time? Are you giving them the opportunity and the tools and support to create with it? Um, and then paired with that and in, in these virtual times, are you giving them opportunities to create and, and explore even offline um, using their hands to build and, and um, and investigate and, and build out models of even ideas. Well, that, that actually goes straight to a next question I had for you, which is how can we use um, the online tools to support offline activities? I think there's real concerns about kids not getting enough fresh air and activities and exercise because they're glued to Zoom calls six hours a day. Right, um, exactly. Um, so I'll, I'll Shout out a, a great uh, resource that Lego had um, going on during this pandemic called Let's Build Together. So it's a website that they created um, designed for parents mm -hmm. and kids to work to together to create some things um, offline. So they're building with um, Lego bricks. Um, a lot of those activities, you don't even need to have Lego bricks to create. Um, they're just, you know, challenges to use maybe even everyday materials. But then um, encouraging uh, parents to capture those moments and then share it out on the web. Um, so they're using the the online tool for inspiration um, and ideas. Um, and then they're having that build activity you know, in person, offline, hands on, but then um, sharing out to a wider audience using the hashtag Let's Build Together, which also provides parents a great way to model for their children how to post appropriately in a social media environment. It kind of gives them a, a real world opportunity to kind of have that conversation with their child. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Jim, let me turn to you. I, I have a sort of a two part question for you. Um, what has been Disney's overall approach to developing educational and enriching content online during this pandemic? And are you partnering with other stakeholders and organizations uh, to support uh, virtual learning? Well, thanks a lot, Stephen. I think um, I would maybe begin by just reacting to um, the point that uh, Leon was making about uh, Lego and the offline and online world. And I think that that has been also a fundamental part of Disney's approach. So I just wanted to maybe open with that to say that I think this will be an innovation that um, will continue, you know, post the pandemic. We found a lot of really creative and interesting ways to take what happens in the huge physical spaces that we have, whether it's our parks and resorts or, you know, on our cruise ships and live theaters and to uh, move those experiences into a uh, virtual space. And uh, so some of that is reflected in the uh, exhibition room. And I think it's um, very much in line with um, those uh, previous comments, but that'll be something uh, that hopefully will continue um, and, uh, and be a positive outcome from, from the pandemic. Um, and more broadly in response to your question, I think it's important to just start with um, how Disney views the internet overall, um, which is that I think as Disney, we've always seen the internet as a positive place for children to learn, to create, to explore. And so in the pandemic, again, we've looked for these new opportunities um, to do just that for the kids and families who uh, look to us around the world. Um, I think what's um, further important to emphasize though, is that uh, as Disney, we're storytellers. We um, have a strong commitment to create high quality, uh, curated, positive, safe, inclusive content. And so we're not educators. And that's where your point, I think, about partnerships comes in, because mm -hmm. 
Um, we in the pandemic have continued to create that great content with these uh, characteristics. And then we're able to um, partner with the educators that are on the front lines, you know, creating curricula and educating our kids in order to amplify the work, um, you know, that, that they're doing. And I think, um, again, I'd refer people to what's in the uh, exhibition room. We have sort of some wonderful examples there. We do um, uh, a great partnership with Khan Academy and we uh, have brought Imagineering in a Box and Pixar in a Box to them. Imagineering in a Box is this uh, wonderful platform for the students to be able to conceive and create uh, their own theme park uh, mm. uh, through uh, various uh, uh, project-based exercises. Pixar in a Box gives the kids an opportunity to uh, really create beautiful animation um, leveraging uh, skills they already have or learning new skills uh, around math, science, computer science, humanities. Um, so th it's, it's working in those partnerships in order to be able to uh, uh, rely on the expertise of those stakeholders who are on the front lines. And we continue to do what we're, you know, the experts at, which is to create that, um, those magnificent stories and the content that really brings the kids. And if I can take just um, 10 more seconds to say, I think sure. it's really important to, um, you know, one thing we've learned at Disney is we, we can't just sort of take our characters and apply them to existing materials, right? We need to get creative. We need to um, create um, engaging content through these partnerships that is, um, you know, really uh, tailored to what, what the need is. It's um, not enough to just lend lend our characters, but to really get in there and create the kinds of things that I described and um, more of what you would see um, in the exhibition room. Uh, hopefully people will be able to look at it afterward. But um, so thank you very much. Not at all, Jim. And I, by the way, we just had a question uh, from one of our participants, uh, Becky Frisbee. Will, will you be sharing the links for these resources? And Jim, I think you just answered that question. So what you've just described will be in the exhibit booth, is that correct? Uh, that and, and much more. I think uh, it will be just fun and engaging to look at it. So definitely tremendous, people to look tremendous. At it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. that. And that's why we're so excited about using this new platform, by the way, uh, to actually bring people from the conversation into the exhibit area afterwards uh, to go deeper, um, should you want to. Deirdre, let me come to you next. Um, Here's a really curious question. Uh, what's the potential for remote learning to change attitudes towards what is a very thorny topic, homework, particularly when everything is working from home? I mean, after, a, a, as I mentioned, and some kids are spending six hours a day on Zoom calls, do you then give them yet more work to do from home? What's, what's your view on, on homework? Yeah, I, I think this is a really important and interesting topic. And, and as Jim and Leanna mentioned, um, there are concerns about screen time, but there are also really great activities that are both offline and online. Um, with Minecraft, we really encourage um, that kind of planning and participation. It might be if you're building a model of your house or your school in Minecraft, um, going out and exploring, walking around, maybe visiting a local landmark in your neighborhood, um, and then coming back and building that in Minecraft and, and sharing it, as Leanna mentioned, um, and bringing in some of that digital citizenship and online and safety as part of the conversation. Um, in terms of homework, I, I have two kids who are doing remote learning, um, continuing from the spring into the fall now. Um, and it is an important question thinking about um, what is the role of homework and, and how much are they doing during the school day. Um, I'm, I'm personally excited to see some of the disruption. I know it's really hard for administrators and for educators, but I think there's some really important conversations happening um, and pulling out what are the most important pieces and how does education evolve with um, technology and some of the changes driven by the pandemic? Hmm. Well, one of the biggest changes we've seen is this issue of equity. And I mentioned earlier, you know, the, uh, the startling uh, statistics about how many kids are not being able to access uh, online classes. What's What's your personal view? What's Minecraft? I mean, how are you guys thinking about this issue? 
Yeah, it's really important. We recently released Minecraft Education Edition on Chromebooks. We have a great partnership with Google Education, also with Apple Education on iPads. Um, so our goal has been to make Minecraft Education Edition available on as many devices as possible. So students may have a school device or they may have a device at home that they're using um, where they can do these lessons and challenges um, as part of their school experience. We've also made uh, Minecraft content available for free for consumers that already own another version of Minecraft. So we pulled some of the favorite lessons like the International Space Station that we created in partnership with NASA, um, a lesson from a Minecraft marketplace creator about um, becoming a marine biologist, for example. Um, and we packaged that content together, made it available for free so that families can access that for those moments when you maybe have an important meeting and you also have um, a kid at home. Um, so we've really looked to see how can we support both the, the traditional K through 12 education environment as well as um, what families are going through right now. Great, great. Um, by the way, I should have mentioned, uh, Jim is uh, coming to us from London and Josie from Geneva. So we have quite the international perspective here. Josie, I wanna to come to you um, and ask you from UNICEF's perspectives, what are you seeing around the world in respect to remote learning? What, both the good and the not so good. Thank you, thank you for, for bringing that up. I, I, of course, this is a, absolutely a, a global issue uh, because of COVID over 190 countries have had school, um, countrywide school closures and that's impacted, you know, what 1.6 billion uh, students all around the world. So uh, we have to think about these issues playing out in extremely different contexts. And remember that in many countries, less than half of the population has access to the internet. And there's disparities between countries, but also within countries. And then again, within households and thinking about barriers that certain groups might might encounter, like, like for example, girls in, in, in households trying to access devices and connectivity. So I think we, we have to unpack uh, the implications for equity in an extremely, extremely diverse context. And this is a this is a challenge that's rolling out throughout the world. To start maybe unpacking some of what we're seeing around the world, I really would refer to a recent report that was published by colleagues at the Innocenti Research Office, which I've also placed in the um, in the booth for you to have a look at uh, later. It, it, it builds on insights from uh, from UNICEF offices in over 120 countries. But some very, very top line um, key findings that they've seen is that because the digital divides are so stark, um, you can't really rely on one delivery channel. There needs to be a blend of, of multiple delivery channels. So they're seeing a mix of TV, radio, take home packages and, and various other mechanisms to reach as many children as possible because the rural poor are the most likely to be left out of, of solutions that, reply, that, that rely exclusively on, on technology and technology enabled remote learning. They've also found the really, really keen and huge importance of, of supporting teachers, parents and caregivers to actually support their, their children at home, particularly may, where there may be literacy problems uh, inside of the household and supporting children also with psychosocial support and making sure they're equipped with the tools to, to ena enable their children to, to access the Internet and, and these tools in a safe way. And they've also seen lots of different ways and, and initiatives to make sure that they're continuously gathering feedback and monitoring how reach and quality is, is, is playing out with these different uh, tools and these responses that have needed to happen really quite quickly um, at such a large scale. So using SMS, using messaging apps and other ways to sort of collect the data needed in an ethical way, considering the implications of that to make sure that the response is is reaching as many children as possible and also delivering you know the outcomes that, that are needed um, so i really invite you to have a look at that report i think it shows some really uh, uh important insights from from different contexts and um, and there's a couple of other resources there as well um talk about um the issue of children's rights and and where are you seeing both risks and opportunities given uh, the sheer amount of time the kids are now having to be online, um, not just for education, but also maybe in some cases the only way they can uh, be with their friends or with their grandparents or whatever. What, give, us, give us that view, which um, is particularly uh, strong coming from UNICEF. 
Absolutely. Um, I think that, well, a key place to start uh, when, when thinking about this is to recognize that children's rights apply online the same way as they do offline. And uh, with one in, one in three uh, internet users globally as a child, this is such a really important new arena for us to think about how do we uphold children's rights and what are the different roles that different stakeholders play in, in realizing that. Oh, another parallel with the offline world is, is of course, children's rights are, are interrelated and indivisible. So we have to find ways of protecting children from violence while protecting their right to privacy, while protecting their right to freedom of expression um, all at the same time. And although, as you mentioned, today we're focusing on virtual classrooms or virtual learning environments that can take many different shapes because children are interacting more with the digital world. They're spending a lot of time also on new platforms, different kinds of platforms, finding lifelines to, you know, connecting with friends and family um, for, to find entertainment, playing games uh, and doing all kinds of other things to try and maintain a sense of normality, which, of course, has also highlighted again, as we mentioned, the importance of, of closing these digital divides and uh, and inequalities. Mm. But I think, yeah, um, I, 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 I think we can talk about in terms of specific risks. Uh, we, we often talk about the the the, the tongue twister, the, the content risks, contact, uh, conduct, and some co commercial risks as well. I I, I think that uh, maybe some of the some of the resources uh, in in the in the booth will go into more of those risks specifically. But but we also have to recognize the huge opportunities that children would derive from having access and making sure that those risks and and opportunities are balanced. Something that we're seeing also again from, from research that's done by UNICEF and others is maybe a positive note for parents who are worried about screen time at this moment is that when we look at children's well-being and mental health overall, the absolute number of hours of the screen time itself isn't a very good explainer for, for the overall well-being of a child. What's happening in the child's life offline, the parental support networks, what's, you know, the offline environment is, is really, really uh, important and online what they're doing and the content they're interacting with is a lot more important as an explanation than the absolute amount of time that uh, they're spending. So maybe that's a, a positive note for, for um, yeah, for, for families that are a bit worried about that at the moment. Josie, let me stay with you one one more question. And, and that's what do you see the role of the companies, not just those represented here, um, but what, what role do you see them playing in supporting parents, kids, caregivers as they're navigating uh, this whole new world of learning online? Do, do you have any particular views on that? I think absolutely. Companies have, have such a vital role to play and so much to, to offer when it comes to um, supporting children's rights online and offline. We, we think about the UN guiding yeah. principles on business and human rights and the child rights and business principles as our main as our main frameworks. But I think this is a particularly important question and topic to think about during COVID because parents need help. They have a lot on their plate. They're dealing with teleworking. They're dealing with potentially job losses, all kinds of other obstacles at this emergency moment that um, many of the most vulnerable children might not have the level of parental guidance available at home to to enable them to to make the most of, of technology while while protecting and being safe from from the risks i think some of the most powerful contributions that companies can make is to actually design those in online environments that have child rights considerations at their core. We often talk about safety. We, t we think about digital marketing, what kinds of commercial messages are ch children being exposed to, data privacy, so what information is being collected about children, are they aware of, of that? If, what that information is and how it's used? And also companies can provide those empowering tools and information and resources to help um, children and parents navigate. I'd really highlight a technical note that UNICEF produced with partners, including End Violence Against Children, a couple of months ago that, that, that lists out a huge number of resources on some of these topics, including industry's role. Um, but I, uh, another obvious way for, for companies to, to play a role, and, and I think from a UNICEF perspective, I can only really highlight 
the, the power of working in partnership with companies. And I couldn't possibly mention all of the work that's happening, but for example, the, the learning passport with Microsoft, which has just been really rolled out and expanded with COVID, the, the work we've done with Lego on, on safeguarding online and offline and looking at best practice when it comes to implementing this, the child rights and business principles, uh, you know, Google and the data for good, YouTube with streaming of the world's largest lesson, COVID video, and Disney's been involved in thinking about, you know, industry guidelines and uh, our toolkits and discussion papers for many years. So, so that it's the tip of the iceberg, but I think it signals the value of really combining our strengths and, and working also in partnership, as Jim was talking about, to, to deliver as much results as we can for children at this moment and beyond. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. And a perfect segue to Alicia. Sorry to, uh, to no, well, thank you for your patience. Um, but you and actually, let me give you an opportunity to respond either to Josie or to anyone else that you've uh, heard uh, before I put in my first question. Is there something that you wanted to uh, comment on first? Um, I'm just to kind of pick up on what Josie was saying about the child rights because I think it's so important. I mean, it's important always, but it's particularly important in this moment. I mean, we think about we think about children's rights, we think about freedoms from and freedoms to. So freedoms from, you know, exploitation, but also freedoms to participate, to play, to explore. And I think that's, you know, kind of crucially important at this moment. And unfortunately, there's a lot of children's um, rights that are being infringed upon because of the kind of circumstances and risk that they currently face. So they're not necessarily able to access, um, you know, friendships and peer groups are not necessarily able to access education and, um, you know, the kind of provisions that they would normally, you know, even things like social services or support services for children with disabilities. So I think one of the things that Google has tried to do, I mean, there's no tech tool or there's no ed tech provider that is going to replace or kind of substitute for that kind of in-person face-to-face um, -face experiences that children would have had. But what we've tried to do is provide the kind of infrastructure and tools that can supplement that given the current context that we're in. And so, you know, things, it, there obviously has been, you know, an increased uptake in tools like our G Suite for Education and Google Classroom tools. And there it's, you know, teachers are learning a, an entirely new environment. In many respects, teachers that will never have used digital tools before. And so what we are trying to do as a company, I think, is make even just some of that basic kind of infrastructure and platform level support as easy and as seamless as possible, in addition to providing resources like our Teach From Anywhere and Teach From Home resources that are kind of trying to help teachers kind of upskill quickly um, at no cost to try to get, you know, give them those skills and kind of opportunities that they in many cases, we're not expecting to have this year. And I think working with education ministries, so for example, in Italy, you know, when the country went into lockdown earlier in the year, we were able to kind of provide direct support for the Italian Ministry of Education to kind of get, you know, millions of students actually getting access to resources in a matter of kind of days and weeks and that, you know, at that point, because it was such a kind of rapid deployment or even things like, you know, working with the Japanese Ministry of Education to get their YouTube and YouTube kids, you know, profiles set up so that they're able to disseminate content that way. And I'm obviously I'm sort of speaking a little bit about formal education, but of course there's so much that happens in terms of non-formal learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think just, you know, we were talking earlier about connections between online and offline experiences and, you know, the popularity of channels on YouTube like and YouTube Kids, like Cosmic Kids Yoga, you know, which is like, or Art for Kids Hub, you know, which is really, I think, are great success stories in terms of finding really thoughtful content that is helping kids move and play and kind of create using, um, you know, not necessarily needing a lot of supplies or kind of materials on hand. So I think, you know, both in terms of the services that we try to kind of create at both in terms of the platforms themselves, but also in terms of the content. Um, one of the other, I think there's been two also exciting initiatives that we've launched during the COVID period, just to try to make life a bit easier for parents um, to kind of help organize information and make it a bit more accessible. One has been the teacher approved apps hub on the Google Play Store. So there's a new kind of kids tab where all the apps on that tab have all been kind of reviewed or multiply reviewed by teachers to kind of ensure um, not necessarily that they are high quality learning outcomes, although many are, but also that they are kind of 
uh, thoughtfully designed play opportunities and, and ways to engage. And then additionally, we just sort of just launched a kind of a tablet version, which brings together both the apps uh, that I've just mentioned that have been reviewed by teachers, but also books um, from Google Books and sort of some of the kind of best, you know, most thoughtful content on YouTube Kids to kind of create opportunities for kids to watch, to play, to make. Um, and I think that's one of the roles that a big platform like ours can play is to just to try to help bring a little bit of method to the madness because mm. everyone is scrambling with very, very little time. Um, and so to the extent that we can make those tools easy to use and easy to access and easy to find your way to, you know, great quality experiences, I think that's been a major focus of ours in the last couple of months. Great. Great, thanks. And we, we've heard a lot uh, from you, Alicia, and others about great content and materials for teachers. Talk a little bit about um, how to reach parents, and 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 what insights from your new book uh, would you give us? I, your subtitle: How Hopes and Fears About Technology Shape Children's Lives. And presumably, you came up with that before the pandemic arrived. Uh, so. How how has the experience of the last six months uh, affected your own thinking about how best to reach and support parents during this time? Indeed, we did write the book before the pandemic, um, and I don't think we knew quite how prescient in some ways some of the, the findings and observation of the book would be. But I think one of the things that we noted from parents is that they really have very few sources of advice and support. So one of the things that we did was we asked parents about where they go for sort of, you know, parenting dilemmas in general, like what to feed your kid or what to do about sleep. And, and we asked the same question again in terms of where they go for sort of digital dilemmas. And, you know, internet searches came out high for both of those, uh, both of those questions. But what was really notable is that when they had parenting dilemmas kind of in general, they had a list of sources of support that they went to. So whether that was their own parents or Medic, you know, health professionals or their children's teachers. But when it came to digital dilemmas, actually most of those kind of sources of support dropped way down. And actually what was interesting was that parents weren't going to a health professional. They certainly weren't going to their own parents, you know, because they felt that they weren't necessarily able to kind of access and understand the kind of dilemmas that the, you know, particular technologies that their children were interacting with might, might give rise to. And another mm -hmm. interesting finding was that they weren't going to other parents because they often found that other parents uh, would would judge them, would judge them harshly. Um, and so one of the hopefully opportunities of this, in some ways, very terrible time um, is, I think, a little bit of like a loosening, of perhaps, of some of that judgment and some of that uh you know, as Josie described, kind of screen time, you know, kind of holding on to that screen time discourse, because actually what we've all realized, and I think we certainly have known to be true for a while at Google, is that screen time can mean so many different things. I mean, it can mean really active, engaged um, conversations and relationships. It can mean uh, passively kind of sitting back and relaxing and just, you know, kind of watching a show, which in many ways actually also still has its place, especially in a period of high anxiety and um, you know, concern. So one thing I often advise parents is just because your kid has been on Zoom all day on school doesn't necessarily mean that they don't need to watch a Disney show or, you know, relax in other ways and kind of kick back at the end of the day or play a game. It doesn't need to be all kind of learning all the time. And then, sorry, one final kind of finding that I think is really resonant for us at Google is that, you know, we talk a lot about a concern that, you know, parents expressed a lot of concern in our research about, you know, the kid was on social media or they were texting their friends and the parent was really concerned, you know, like, why don't they want, you know, this face-to-face -face interaction? And I think what we've all really seen is actually kids are desperate for face-to-face -face interaction and, mm -hmm. you know, desperate to get back to it. And actually the great surge in availability of digital media has not in any way actually replaced the importance for them and for families of being together and having dinner with families. So it's wonderful that we're able to provide those tools for support in this trying time, but it doesn't mean that mm -hmm. when this time finishes that that will suddenly we'll all just be, you know, wanting to be on Zoom calls all the time. <laughs> um, so one of our uh, participants have asked for the name of the book, uh, Parenting for a Digital Future, folks, go out and get it. 
Um, oh, I see Becky has already responded. We'll put up a link uh, to make sure that uh, people get access to that, Alicia. Um, and by the way, I just want to remind you all, and I'm going to open up um, uh, the floor to you all to uh, ask questions, make comments. What are you seeing at home? Uh, perhaps you have a child who is going to school, maybe on a part-time basis. Uh, what are the triumphs? What are the turmoils that you're going through? Uh, we'd love to, to hear from you all. Um, I'm just going to throw the floor open to, to any of you to answer. Uh, we've already heard a number of really interesting examples of products and services and content. Is there, is there something that you guys have missed not telling us about? Uh, is there something that's come out of um, your work that you'd really like to emphasize? Stephen. Hey, Stephen. Um, this is Leanna. Oh, sorry. Why don't Jim. you go ahead? Go ahead, Jim. I, should, okay. Well, I just oh, quickly, okay. I, I was going to uh, mention, um, as I was hearing uh, Alicia and uh, Josie talk in particular, I thought about the um, question of the overall well-being of the kids and how much that supports the virtual learning environment. And so um, I know Alicia referred to some of the uh, exercise videos and that kind of thing. That's been uh, hugely important for, for Disney too. And um, we have a healthy living initiative that is longstanding and really crucial to who we are, uh, how uh, families see us and trust us and what they turn to us for. Um, but the other thing I was thinking about was uh, this question of uh, the environment. And I wanted to also say that these kind of uh, uh, broader well-being questions, I think, are really uh, important right now. So we've done a lot around getting kids, how do you keep them connected to nature when they're, you know, stuck inside? And as Alicia said, you know, on the one hand, they're on the screens, but how do you um, give parents multiple options, whether um, the content is super great about uh, nature and exploration and this kind of thing. So we've created some apps even to get uh, kids out into their backyards or um, just kind of interacting in citizen science environments. And it meets multiple needs because it's, there's virtual learning there, but there's also a huge well-being element. And I think that the, the ideas I've heard from all the companies um, really support that um, element of this problem too, you know, keeping the kids kind of um, just okay, you know, healthy um, is so crucial. Um, so we've had a big focus in those areas too. Great. Thank you. Liana, I think you were trying to come in. Yes. Um, so two resources I wanted to make sure that I shared. Um, the first being around this idea of, of children's well-being and digital safety um, and, and giving parents opportunities to have uh, important conversations around being online with their child. Um, I know that sometimes uh, that's an interesting space for parents because it's not necessarily something that they had when they were growing up. And so sometimes it's hard for them to figure out ways to engage in conversations with their child. So the Lego group actually came out with a, there's a website called uh, Small Builds for Big Conversations. And, um, and it's a way that you can uh, build together um, to help open up those conversations uh, to have with your child around how to be safe online um, and what to do maybe if you come across something that uh, makes you feel uncomfortable um, and how to uh, kind of navigate that space a little bit. The other resource I wanted to make sure that I shared is really from Lego Education. Um, and. It, in, in working with school districts and teachers, um, you know, we know that uh, teachers really had to respond in a crisis mode, um, you know, back in the spring, all of a sudden moving from uh, a world of comfort to a world of the unknown in this virtual space and mm, trying mm. to find ways that we could support them in, in transitioning from from one uh, instructional delivery mode to another. And so we have a website that's up called um, uh, Hybrid Learning, um, which is great because it has uh, great resources, not just for educators, but also for parents. And like, how do you set up a space at home to help ensure that your child has an optimal learning environment? How can you have conversations with your child around the learning that's happening and provide guidance without really taking over of the learning, right? Um, and so we hope that those resources will be better official to educators and parents. Excellent. And I see links have already been uh, posted. That's that's great. Deirdre, what did you um, did you want to add anything at this point? 
Yeah, you know, I, I would love to build on what Jim and Leanna talked about. Um, another topic that has come um, more into the forefront is social emotional learning. Um, and, and I think this is, you know, it's obviously been important for a long time, but even more so, so now with sometimes the isolation of students being at home um, away from their friends. And so it, it's it's a really interesting opportunity to explore that with some of the digital tools, and some of the physical tools. Uh, last year, we released um, a lesson called the Mindful Night, and that's night with a K. Um, and that allows students to navigate through a Minecraft world and explore um, relaxation, breathing, and sort of a meditative environment um, and build some of those skills in um, patience and self-regulation um, that are so important to social emotional learning. Um, I, I, we've, we've also seen the importance and the value of that connection, um, both in the learning environment and for social connection that, um, that gaming and play allow. Um, and so it's been um, I, I think educators are sometimes anxious about bringing a game into the classroom. It's you know not not traditionally been part of the core part of the teaching and learning environment, um, but they see the response and the reaction, both that social emotional learning, um, the opportunity to really teach and reinforce important digital citizenship skills. Um, as well as having students in a place where they're comfortable. It's an environment that they know where they feel confident taking risks that they might not be as confident in other parts of the classroom and other forms of education. Mm. Let, me, let me ask you, uh, anyone can answer this, but let's, let's assume um, that by this time next year, September, 2021, uh, we have a vaccine. We are we are going back to school. Um, you know, life has come back to some kind of normal. What would you most like to see happen in that new school year, and what would you most not like to see carried over from this period of time? I know it's a slightly left field question, but I was just going to put that out there. I think I, I could start. Go ahead. Um, uh, one thing we've seen is much more parent engagement in education. And I think that's been really challenging for a lot of families. There's, you know, just so many different scenarios. Um, but, but I do think overall an increased um, awareness of what's happening in education, increased respect for educators um, and, and the challenges that come with bringing technology into the classroom and just just in general, um, all the pressures of thinking about what what are the new job skills for the next generation. So I think I, I do have a hope that there's a continued um, engagement and respect for the education experience. Um, you know, I also think there's real value in, and this is a, a disruption. Um, there are some trends like um, project-based learning. So taking a subject, uh, I, I think Jim mentioned sustainability, and thinking about how does that connect in with uh, history, uh, literature, um, science, humanities, um, and so I think there's real opportunity to, to think a bit differently from the way classrooms have operated for 100 years or more um, and think about what, what are some learnings that we've had in terms of direct instruction time versus um, students working together and collaborating. Thank you. If I could add a thought also, it's just I completely agree with everything Deirdre just said and also in terms of, you know, we're seeing increased kind of self-paced and sort of project-based learning, I think, through teachers that are sort of able to kind of do smaller group or one-to-one -one, um, kind of conversations and support in some sense in a different way than they were able to before. And so hopefully some of that, you know, the kind of acknowledgement that kids need different kinds of time and different kinds of support and trying to figure out how to individualize some of that. But I, I actually want to kind of pivot to a slightly different topic, which I think is important to recognize here also, which is that you know, there's also been a, a real rise in conversations around, I think, important but often invisible topics around inequity, but specifically in the context of the U.S. around racial justice and um, racial uh, equity. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do as a platform is provide a space and platform for some of those conversations. So we've kind of curated age-appropriate playlists on topics around racial justice, for example, for preschoolers and for school age kids. So if I were to think also of one thing that I hope um, kind of comes out of this time actually is a more um, nuanced and, and kind of present conversation around topics around equity, not just in terms of racial equity, but also in terms of access. And to some extent, I think that this 
period of time has really brought many of those tough conversations to the fore. So I think to the extent that school districts are kind of grappling with issues of, you know, kids' home lives were often very invisible to them before, and they, I think, mm -hmm. now in many ways are actually visible. Um, so I hope that some of that actually carries over when we all, I don't want to say return to normal because I'm not sure what normal is going to look like, but in the next kind of era and phase. Yeah, I, I agree. I, the school communities that I participate in as a parent, as a board member, and through my work with Minecraft, um, I also see um, more of a, a willingness and a boldness to tackle these topics around racism, discrimination. Um, I think that will be really important to carry into the next school year and the future. Um, I, I want to ask you all a question that I get asked, um, and, and I want you both for with your professional hat on, but also as your personal as a parent hat on. And the question is, is it okay for my kid to turn her camera off while uh, she's in a lesson? Uh, because my school has said that they have to be on all the time. What's, what's your view about um, these, the, these cameras attached to laptops or tablets peering into um, our homes and in some cases our children's bedrooms? Anyone got any visceral uh, reactions to that? stab at it. Um, I haven't gotten the, asked this question, but I think it's a good one. Um, on some level, you know, many kids find it very overwhelming and uh, anxiety producing to see themselves on camera and they can find it very distracting. Very overwhelmed that comes from being on Zoom all the time and the kind of pressure to perform. I can say my daughter particularly gets incredibly shy. Um, so a kind of mandatory camera on situation obviously could feel very, very pressured at the same time as I completely understand, you know, for many schools, they, A, have some statutory obligations to make sure that children are engaging. And so that's one way that they can kind of actually ascertain that is by seeing the faces of the kids, but also, you know, from the perspective of wanting to help kids continue to feel connected to the community and, you know, kind of knowing each other and then the, the hope that they may be back together in person that they want you know, to see each other's faces. So I understand it's a real kind of pressure. I think in general kind of mandating something, you know, may of course disenfranchise kids who don't have like good access at home. And so maybe don't get, a don't have a stable connection to be able to have their video on or, maybe in a room with other siblings who are on other computers or you know, doing other activities and that might be really distracting. So I hope um, that schools will be you know, sensitive to those kinds of issues, but I understand the tension, of course. Mm. Anyone else got a strong feeling about this? Uh, Becky Frisbee has written in to say, students in my school district do not have to turn on their cameras. Well, it's all over the map, certainly in the United States. Uh, we're seeing, um, you know, school districts that are absolutely insisting, others who are saying, no, it's okay. Um, so it, it, it's one that we're sort of making up as we go along. Um, oh, and we also hear, uh, my child's high school requires cameras on, and I am okay with that. So um, there you go. Let me, we're, we're starting to run out of time. I do want to make sure that we cover um, the kind of public policy issues around this. And we're, we're of course a Washington DC based nonprofit and we work in the public policy sphere. Um, tell me, are there any existing or proposed laws or regulations that you think um, do really good work for in this space in terms of um, uh, educational content or experiences for kids? Or are there some laws and regulations that actually get in the way? Um, anyone got any views on the politics of all of this? I can comment on a couple of areas. One is something that we've touched on, which is access to broadband, um, both here in the US and worldwide. Um, you know, from an equity standpoint, I think there's a lot that governments can do um, in order to extend access. Um, another area that is really important and as we think about future job readiness and the future of work is computer science education. Um, there's, there's been a STEM push for years. Code.org has done some really important work in um, making 
coding both more accessible but also more appealing through their work with um, educators, um, working with, with partners, some of whom are represented on the call here today um, in the Hour of Code campaign, um, as well as um, their work in the policy area. So, so those two areas, access to broadband and um, more consistent standards um, around computer science education, I think are really important for the future. Great, thank you. Just to um, offer one, you know, piece of support, I think certainly in terms of computer science education, also in terms of media literacy and digital literacy, I think we, you know, certainly feel this time has kind of highlighted how important it is for um, students, young people, but also parents and educators to have kind of, you know, more understanding of the digital environment, not only in terms of kind of technical literacy and how to use the tools that are available to them, but also that kind of critical media literacy and understanding of the environments that they operate in. Certainly, you know, proposals like the Camera Act, which are to help fund, you know, more research and understanding of children's media use and the effects of their media use, both in the short and the long term. I think this period of time has obviously highlighted how crucially important it is for us all to have better um, high quality research and evidence to understand, you know, what what the risks and opportunities are and, and how those are in many cases sort of unevenly distributed. Yeah, we're, we're a big supporter of the Camera Act too. And we call on not just our US government, but governments around the world to put funding into good quality research into this space so that we know how best to respond. Um, I'm going to draw this to a close and I'm going to pose this question to you all. Um, what one piece of advice would you give um, to a struggling parent uh, who's got, you know, trying to either hold down a job from home or is an essential worker and is leaving home? What one piece of advice would you live, leave for them uh, to get through this school year. And um, it can be as 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 broad or as narrow as you as you think. Um, don't want to call on anyone, but uh, just popcorn style. Who, who's got a piece of advice for a parent? All right, I'll call on people. Jim, <laughs> come on, piece of advice. I'm a struggling parent. I don't know what the hell to do. What should I do? You know, I think there's so much um, information that bombards us all as parents and it causes a lot of stress because in the pandemic, it's just all come at you so fast and so furious. So it feels, uh, you know, what we've learned at Disney is like, we're trying to really curate stuff. So put it together for the parents and deliver it, you know, through trusted means and trusted brands. So we have all this great Nat Geo content together, you know, you can kind of either like, don't feel bad if you have to, you know, leave your kid to self-direct for a while, as Alicia was saying, you know, to watch a video and then we kind of layer it in and follow up with activities and experiments and that kind of thing. And so I think finding those really, um, we've tried at Disney to really deliver those curated places that parents can go to and not, you know, feel overwhelmed. And so I think, you know, looking for those, um, looking for those places instead of just letting it all come at you when, you know, the latest in the morning. I might add a few words. I think I'm one of the only non-parents on the panel, so not the best person to, to answer this, but, but I would uh, highlight that UNICEF has a parenting hub uh, with some sort of really useful articles and information that that link is on, on the in the booth. Um, but I think uh, just to, to round off with a couple of things that, that were kind of bubbling away while we were having the conversation before is I think one of the really great things that's come out of this conversation is that we are having so much more focus on on access and equity and i think when we're talking about access also thinking more about accessibility sort of how are children with disabilities interacting with some of these platforms what adjustments are needed for enabling all children to uh, to make the most of this in, you know in this context of much more increased reliance in terms of time but also different activities are we catering to to all children and in terms of of governments i just wanted to say absolutely governments have a have a critical role to play i i, I won't comment specifically on the us but, but there have been also some some uh, recent 
tools that have been created, for example, the ITU's Child Online Protection Guidelines include specific uh, guidelines for policymakers. Uh, I've also put that in the in the link, and I hope that's uh, of interest and useful to some some of you in the audience. Great, Josie. Thank you so much, um, Liana, Deirdre. Yeah, You've got a tweet tweet length piece of advice. Um, I just have two. One is don't don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, there's you know there's lots of resources out there. People who want to provide help for parents. So don't feel like you're alone in um, in this situation by any means. And two, take time to play with your child. Um, you know you probably have a lot of opportunity to be at home right now together. And play provides a wonderful opportunity to reduce stress um, in stressful times. Very well said. Deirdre, last words. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, trust your gut. As Leanna mentioned, you know your child best and you may realize they need to turn the camera off, they need a break. So um, leave the judgment behind and trust your gut. Really good. Alicia, last word. I think those are great points to leave on, Stephen. So I'm not sure I have too much to add except for just be really patient with yourself and your kid. This is a really challenging set of circumstances. I think everyone's really doing their best. Very wise, very wise. Well, I just want to thank you all so much for giving your time and your expertise, the resources that I know are already coming up in the chat box. Uh, shortly, people can go to the Expo button there on the left-hand side of your screen to see much more in the way of what uh, all of these wonderful companies and organizations are doing in this space. Um, just a reminder that, uh, and, and Fozy, we, we have our own resources. I should make sure to put in a shameless plug for our good digital parenting resources, our seven steps. Our number one of the seven steps is to talk with your kids early and often. So that would be the, the one that I would leave with you all. Um, we have our big annual conference coming up in November, November 18th. Um, will be, not surprisingly, a virtual event on this hop-in platform, and we're very, very excited uh, for that. It's called Building Resilience, which I think we've heard a lot of examples of, of doing just that uh, on today's session. I um, want to thank, again, our, our panelists. I want to thank my own team uh, who've put this together and doing all of the whizzy stuff behind the scenes to make sure that we could be both seen and heard. And um, please join us uh, in the expo for the next half hour, we can continue this conversation. Uh, and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank Stephen. you.